Alrighty, uh, let's get our Bibles and turn to John chapter 1. We're uh, studying these little meetings with Jesus, and uh, the first person in John that Jesus has a little talk to uh, is a guy named Nathaniel. And uh, he is uh, going to be one of his disciples. He doesn't know it at first. Uh, he gets an invitation from Philip. Uh, we studied about that and all the things that a witness does um, to witness to people. And here in verse 47, John chapter 1, it says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. And saith of him, Behold, an Israelite, indeed, in whom is no guile. Well, that's something to really say about somebody. Um, of course, Jesus knew everybody. Uh, so here's, here's this guy, and he, uh, he don't take no guff, in other words. He don't, he don't, he's, he's a, uh, what we call a straight shooter, Nathaniel was. He, he, uh, when he said something to somebody, he meant it. He didn't try to fool you or pull the wool over your eyes or uh, politic you. Um, he just laid it out there. And I think Jesus likes that kind of thing in a person. Um, I've met lots of people in my life that were, um, well, let's face it, some of them were slimy. You've met slimy people. They just, they, they just ooze. Um, an oily something about their personality and whenever I meet somebody like that I make sure my hands on my wallet and, <laughs> and, and, and you know uh, the silverware is put up and uh, because you know somebody like that they're not shooting straight with you they want something and they just won't come out and say it they want to they want to politic you they want to uh, they they, they want to kind of ooze around. And they, then you get people that aren't really slimy. They're kind of oily, but they're not slimy. Uh, and I, I've met some Christians that were that way. I really haven't met very many slimy Christians. Maybe one or two. And I wondered about them being Christians. Because it's hard to be that way and be a real Christian, I think. Because if you're that way with man, you're going to be that way with God. And God don't put up with that. God wants you to be a straight shooter with Him. If you go sin, and you need to go to God and say, I've sinned, I've done such, 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 I'm sorry. Lord, please forgive me. Uh, you don't need to do all this uh, kind of... Uh, but Lord, it was then the situation, and the, God don't care about any of that stuff. Uh, God wants you to just be... A, and so I think Jesus liked Nathaniel because he was a, a guy in whom there was no guile. I, I like that kind of saying. Um, Nathaniel saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Uh, he says, Do we know? Do we know each other? I don't. He, he's having a hard time because he don't remember ever meeting Jesus. Philip had told him about Jesus. Maybe Andrew and the rest of them, but he never met Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus was, and yet Jesus seemed to know him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. So when Philip went and told uh, Nathaniel about Jesus, he was sitting under a fig tree. Um, must have been a big fig tree, because my fig tree in my backyard, well, especially now that it, it kind of got clunked, is not very tall, but it, even even before the hurricane came through, it wasn't all that tall. I mean, if you had to sit under it, you had to get way down there to sit under it. Um, so it must have been a big one. And Nathaniel answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. So Jesus answered and said, said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Well, Jesus is kind of a, of course, he's never really amazed, but he, he's kind of, he's kind of given Nathaniel a little bit of a hard time. He says, you mean just because I said I saw you under the fig tree, you're going to believe what I say? 
Uh, he says, Believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. So, this is the kind of person Jesus wanted to be his disciple. Somebody that didn't have a hard time believing something. Uh, we have a whole book here full of things. Some of them are kind of plain. Some of them are, are kind of may rub you the wrong way. They're plain, but they rub you the wrong way. Some things are, are glorious. I mean, they're plain and they're, they're hallelujah time. And then you, then you read some things, you know, like, what in the world's going on here? I don't know what in the world this is. But that's okay. As long as you believe it, whether you understand it or not, that's what Jesus is looking for. Uh, I'm reading through Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel saw a lot of weird things. He did. He, I mean, he just, he saw these critters with four faces on them and wheels within wheels that, uh, you know, they moved around with these critters and, and, and uh, you know, you read that stuff and uh, I, I know a lot of people think they've got it all figured out. I don't know that they got it all figured out. Um, it's, you got to admit some of that stuff is mighty strange. But that's okay. We're not supposed to understand everything. All, all the time in the Bible. If we did, well, why would we need a Bible? We'd already have it down pat. Uh, verse 51, And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Well, that goes back to Jacob's ladder. Uh, when Jacob saw that vision, um, and Nathaniel is going to be standing there on the Mount of Ascension when Jesus goes back into heaven. Uh, I don't know what all they saw. It didn't get recorded there in the, the book of Acts or, or the, the end of Luke. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, he looked at this man and he said, this is a fellow that I need. Now, the Lord looks at people and he figures out how you can fit in his plan. He really needs everybody if he can get them. Um, you say, what about those slimy people? Well, God can take a person like that and de-slime them. Uh, I've seen that happen too. Um, <laughs> when I first came down to Bible school, um, there was a fella that uh, he was from my hometown. And uh, he... Uh, he was going down here to Bible school, and there was another fella. Now, the, the first fella, man, uh, this guy was solid gold. I mean, he loved the Lord. Uh, he believed the book. Um, him, and, him and another guy named Ryman, um, they, they were, man, they were go-getters. They wanted to go for the Lord. This other fella had come down to go to Bible school, but he had been a con man. And to tell you the truth, he still was a little bit of a con man. And uh, one day he uh, came and talked to me about something, about renting an apartment or something. I was looking for a place to live. And this first uh, fellow from my hometown, he, he, he got a hold of me after class. He said, what did D'Angelo talk to you about? I said, oh, he wanted me to come in with him and rent something. He said, don't do it. I said, why? He said, he'll take your money and run. I said, really? He said, really. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I told the guy I wasn't interested, and he went, on, went and got somebody else. But, um, you know, uh, you say, whatever happened to that fella? Well, you know, he never made it through the first year of Bible school. I don't know what happened to him. Um, I hope he learned to do better than what he was trying to do. See, a lot of people don't think they can operate in this world unless they become like the world. And they have this philosophy that, you know, okay, the world, the world is this way. I'm going to be more than, I'm, I'm going to be top of the, the, the heap on this, this heap of whatever the world's heaping up. Well, that's not the way a Christian should be. We, we shouldn't be on the top of the heap of the world. We should be on the top of the heap with the Lord. Amen. The Lord will look after you. Yeah. And you know, uh, I struggled a little bit in Bible school. 
I had a hard, I lived in a camper trailer for a while. Um, that was an interesting place to live. Uh, it, it, everything was convenient. <laughs> I could practically sit on the bed and do, do about everything. Um, but one day, Brother Bill come by. I started going out to the church. And he said, do you live here? I said, well, yeah. He said, uh, i tell you what. Uh, let me try to find you something better. And so that's when I moved over to Florida town. And, and I had a whole big trailer then. I didn't know what to do. I had so much space. But um, uh, the Lord looks after you. Uh, he's, he's looked after my pets. He's looked after my cars. He looks, he looks after my health. Um, he's looked after, you know, the grass in the, in the yard. I, I mean, God, God has looked over everything. And that doesn't mean things don't go wrong. Uh, God has to teach us how to pray. Amen? Amen. And trust in Him. Um, look, at, uh, look at Psalm 50. Let's turn to Psalm 50. Psalm number 50. Look at verse number seven. Verse number seven. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. So God says, Look, I've got some things, I got a bone to pick with you. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices. Or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. So he says, look, I'm not going to fuss at you for the offerings you've offered. Because you've offered them. I will take no bullock out of thy house. Nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine. And the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains. And the wild beast of the field are mine. So, what God is saying to Israel here is God don't need your stuff. He gives stuff to you, and yeah, it's good when you can give to God. It's good when you can offer something to God. But God's more interested in having you than your stuff. He wants you. He wants your mind. He wants your heart. He wants your love. He wants your service. He wants... He wants your body as a living sacrifice, uh, the book of Romans says. So here, but I find it interesting that Nathaniel, uh, well, you know, um, he was impressed that Jesus knew who he was. Uh, that meant something to Nathaniel. I think a lot of people in Jesus' time had forgotten God knows who they were. Um, and a lot of people in churches kind of forgot that fact. God knows everything about you. Um, you, you can't do anything in secret with God. You may have kept a secret in your life and held that secret. Everybody you know may not know that secret, but there's one person that knows that secret, and that's God. And so Nathaniel was impressed because maybe he's thinking, okay, I didn't see anybody around that fig tree when I was sitting there. Uh, maybe he's thinking, okay, well, either this guy's got telescopic vision or he, 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 he's something very special. Um, look at Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah 1. Oh, Jeremiah, he was a young man when God called him. I kind of I kind of have an affinity for Jeremiah. God was a young man when he called me. I was only 19 years old. Say, did you understand it all when you were not? Nope. 
It took me a few years to even figure out what God was calling me to do. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Several things in this verse you need to take note of. First of all, Jeremiah just didn't preach to the Jews. He preached to the nations. And if you go through the book of Jeremiah, when you get toward the end, he's preaching about Babylon and, and he, he's reading them the riot act and several other people, Moab and different places. Um, God, God was interested in being the God of all nations, just not Israel. And there was a lot of people that came over to, to God and and. They would go, you know, they were Gentiles and they, they converted. They became proselytes, what we'd call proselytes. And uh, God, God had sent Jeremiah there to preach. And, and notice that even before he was born, God knew what his plan was. God knew what his job was. God knew what he was going to do through his life. That's the marvelous thing about God. He knows the future even if we don't. He knows all about it. Uh, he knows whether you're going to stub your toe tomorrow, or whether you're going to, uh, you know, break a pencil when you're trying to write. Uh, you say that's this kind of dumb thing. Yeah, but it, no matter how small a thing it is, God knows it. He'll know what you say. He'll know what you think. And so that's the kind of thing that confronted Nathaniel right there in John chapter one. He's met this guy, and he says, I know you, you have no guile, and I saw you sitting under that fig tree before Philip talked to you, and he's just kind of uh, really just saying, really? I didn't see you around there. You know, how do you know me? Uh, well, God knows everybody. Uh, and the things the disciples had to learn, now some of them really didn't learn it. Uh, right off. Uh, Jesus kept doing these miracles and they, they were glad to see the miracles but they didn't really have a clue what they proved. Why in the world did Jesus do miracles in the first place? He did them to show that he was the Messiah and he was God. Um, you notice the Pharisees, uh, you know, they criticized Jesus but none of them were trying to walk on the water. Or turn the water into wine or heal the sick people. And they resented Jesus because he could do all that. But Jesus wanted some men to follow him that would stick with him. Now, now if you get reading the Gospels, you'll find at one time Jesus had a whole bunch of disciples following him. And then one time he got up and said some stuff that was really hard to swallow. Say, why we ain't got nobody sitting in our pews? Because I'm the kind of guy who says stuff that people have a hard time with. They want to go to church and they want the preacher to put on the butter and the jelly and make them feel good. Well, that's not what God called the preacher to do. He, he called the preacher to feed you. And, and some of what he feeds you, you're not going to like. I mean, you know, little kids don't like kale and spinach, but, you know, ma mamas, you need to eat this. It's good for you. And so I get up here and sometimes, you need to eat this. It's good for you. And then sometimes, you know, God gets out the, uh, uh, the swatter and he may give you a swat. Um, I hate them kind of thing. Really, I'd rather never preach one of them ever. But I'm a preacher, and I preach what God tells me to preach. And some people, they come and, you know, sure enough, uh, some guy that has problem with money will come on a Sunday when I talk about money. Brother Vic, how often have I talked about money in my ministry? Ever. Maybe 30 years, I've talked about it three, four times. Literally. But if I ever do decide to preach on money, there's going to be this guy sitting on the back row that oh, the preacher always oh, preaches about money. Well, yeah, when you come, you know, I do. I wonder why that is. God's trying to get your goat there, buddy. Mm, yeah, pray for them people. 
Turn to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. God does all kinds of things to people. So how do you feel about that? Well, <laughs> tell you the truth, I'll, I'll sit up, I'll stand up here and say, Lord, do you really have to do this? I know this person. <laughs> he said, preach it, boy. Preach what I tell you to preach, or I'm going to swat you. Genesis 18, verse 19. 18, 19. Now God's talking about Abraham here. Um, the men of Sodom have come to visit Abraham. And, uh, well, not the people of Sodom, but the people that were going to Sodom. Let me correct that. Uh, and probably these people were the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, probably. And uh, so, verse 16, the men arose and went thence and looked toward Sodom. They went toward, they were going to, they were going to drop the bomb on Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, verse 17, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham the fa that thing which I do? Uh, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. This is what God says about Abraham. I know him. That he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Now, I don't know if you know this, but God knows you. He knows how you handle your family. He knows what you believe and what you don't believe. And accordingly, God will treat you in a certain way because of the person you are that he knows. God never puts on us stuff that's too heavy for us to carry. So, if you're the kind of person that has, uh, you know, may, maybe, uh, I've known people that, you know, you teach them some Bible and they really don't understand it. And you teach it to them again and they still don't get it. Uh, we had a fellow like that come to the church several years ago. He just couldn't get eternal security. No matter how many times I sat down with him, I think Vic sat down with him. Um, Brother Bill sat down with him. Um, he came off and on for several years, and he never could get it. And, and I never understood that, really. Um, in the New Testament, in the Pauline epistles, it's very plain. Once you get saved, you stay saved. He couldn't believe that. He thought he thought if he did certain things, he'd just fall off the wagon. Well, look, God's wagon is is a good wagon. It, 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 nobody's gonna fall off God's wagon. Um, and I tried everything I could show him, and and he just he just wouldn't believe it. And I often, and you know, he went his way, and uh, he hadn't been back. That's been several, several, several years ago. Um, but but I kind of part of me feels sorry for a person like that. But then God reminds me, there's a reason he doesn't believe that thing. I don't know what it is, but God does. And he did, and you know what? He did too, but probably wouldn't admit it. Um, God's going to show you some things in the Bible when you're reading. God's going to show you some things sitting in the pew. Be very careful with it. Um... If God's showing it to you, He wants you to believe it. Make sure it's based on the Scripture, surely. And if it's based on the Scripture, there's no reason you shouldn't believe it. But some people have a hard time. So Abraham was the kind of person that believed what God said. God said, look, look up at the stars. See all them stars? You're going to have that many children. Abraham said, oh boy. I'd have probably thought, oh, that many diapers, huh? <laughs> of 
course, they, they didn't, God didn't tell him all at once, but, you know. But he, he believed God. Uh, look at Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. That's the reason I love the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament shows us pictures of the people that believed and the people that didn't believe. And there were times when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, in man's estimated estimation, they kind of fudged a little bit. Um, they go down in Egypt and all of a sudden, oh, this is not my wife, she's my sister. Well, that, that's, that shows a little bit of lack of faith in God. But of course, we don't know how intimidating those societies were. Um, probably, had I been a person that was alive during World War II, or before the war, and I had gone to Germany, I probably would have acted different just to kind of blend in because I didn't want to get in trouble and get, you know, thrown in prison at a place like that. So don't be too, don't be too uh, critical of some things that people do. Uh, fear will make people do things that they normally wouldn't do, and God knows that too. Uh, look, um... You say, well, God's going to protect me. And then you get in the back alley and you got four or five tough guys that's going to beat you up for your wallet. You know, uh, you may beat yourself up for not having faith in God. But look, uh, God understands the situation you're in. Um, you got to do a mighty heap of praying in that situation to get out of it. If, if that's what's going to take to get it. Of course... Uh, you can always do uh, a prayer with your feet, too. You can run uh, if you can get out of there. Uh, that's what I'd try to do. Uh, Exodus 3, verse number 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. So Jesus knows everything about you. He knows the good things about you. He knows the bad things that happen to you. He knows what makes you sad and what 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 runs you down. And um, I'm glad no, God knows all that stuff. Uh, for one thing, it saves a lot of time. Um, you really don't have to spend hours and hours explaining to God your situation. He knows it all already. All you have to do is say, Lord, uh, I need a way out of this, or I need a solution, or something like that. And you know, God, God, God will look down into your heart, and he'll see your heart. And he'll answer that prayer. Uh, and look, You can go to God with anything. 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 I don't care what it is. Um, huh. Somebody went over to Brother Bill's house one time and um, Clearo was sick. Clearo was his little dog. And so him and his brother got down and uh, Brother Bill was praying and he prayed for his dog. And the brother was surprised. Now, I, I, I wouldn't have been surprised because I know how much Brother Bill loved Clearo. That was his little puppy dog. She was an old dog, but she was, to him, he, she was a puppy. And old Clearo, he got better. God answered that prayer. But, but he had to sit this guy down and said, look, you can pray about anything. And I think he taught the guy something. Because, cause, you know, some people have said, all right, this category over here... You can pray and, and ask God because you need to. It's too big for you to handle. This over here, I got this. We don't need to pray about that. Are you sure about that? Because the older you get, the harder things become. Now, maybe when you're 20, you can handle this pile over here right fine. But I'm going to tell you something. As you get older, that pile of stuff gets 
thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And this pile over here gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You might as well just go ahead and pray about everything. Have done with it. Um, and I'll tell you the truth. In this world, sometimes this world gets so confusing, you don't know what to do. You'll, you'll get... Uh, the other day I talked about, you know, the, the lesser of two evils. Don't you hate those things? I, I mean, but you still have to go to God and say, okay, God, which one do I choose? This one over here is not so good, and this one over here is not so good. But, and, and say, Lord, I, I sure would appreciate a third, third option. Sometimes God will give you a third option. Sometimes he won't. Sometimes he'll make you pick the worst one, and it ends up to be a blessing to you. God does all those kind of weird things. But he knows who you are. He knows what it takes to impress you too. Uh, it didn't take much to impress old good old Nathaniel. I mean all Jesus had to do is tell him he was sitting under a fig tree before he met him. And that impressed him enough to, to join up the, the, the disciple brigade. Oh uh, look at Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48. We'll, we'll kind of, this will be the last one we look at here this morning. Isaiah 48. Verse 3. I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly... And they came to pass. So sometimes God will do stuff in your life. Sometimes he'll answer that prayer rather quickly. You'll turn around and God, uh, I've even had God answer the prayer for I knew he had answered the prayer and I was still praying about it. Have you ever done that? I've done that. And say, well, Lord, you, you, you knew I needed that for I even, I even knew I needed that. Thank you, Lord. But I didn't find out until after I'd prayed. But when I lo got looking at the whole thing, God, God had answered that prayer long before I even... That, that's what this verse is trying to say. Sometimes he does things real quickly. Because I knew that thou art obstinate. <laughs> and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass. I have even from the beginning declared it unto thee, before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou should say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image and my molten image hath commanded them. So God's saying, Look, you uh, you are supposed to be worshiping me, but you're going down to the little idol temple down here, and you're praying to the little idol, and I'm going to do this quickly because because I want you to know that it was me that done it, and not these other little turkey things. Look, you can pray in front of a statue all day long. It ain't going to do nothing for you. It's just a hunk of metal, a hunk of wood, or a hunk of whatever it is it's a hunk of. A hunk of rock. Yeah, a hunk of rock or whatever. I've seen them made of all kinds of things. I used to have a neighbor, and she claimed to be a Christian. Then I happened to, I had to go inside her house for some reason, and her whole house was covered with Buddhas. And I thought to myself, well, I don't see any Christian anything in here. There wasn't a Bible. There wasn't, it was just Buddha from stem to stern. Uh, look, if you worship Buddha, you're not a Christian. Period. People that worship Buddha are Buddhists. People that worship Jesus Christ the Savior are Christians. That, that. And you say, what do you mean by that? I mean, say born again people that believe the Bible are Christians. Say, what about all those say born again people that don't believe the Bible? Well, those people are deceived by and large. Now, the people that's deceived them, I wonder about. But that's another story. Look then at verse number 8. Verse number 8 in that same chapter. So God's talking about to Israel. And he's talking about the... The portion of Israel is worse than all these little statues. Yea, thou heardest not. Yea, thou knewest not. Yea, from that time that thine ear was not open. For I knew that thou wouldst deal very treacherously. And was called a transgressor from the womb. 
Um, God knows all about us. God knows all the good things we do. God knows all the bad things we do. God knows when we're listening to Him. God knows when we're not listening to Him. You say, do people not listen to God? Oh yeah, all the time. I've even had that problem myself. Sometimes it's out, uh, uh, It's mostly out of, uh, I'm looking this way and God's coming over from this way. And I'm expecting an answer over here. Now, I don't know that God blames you much for that, because we're only human. But God will get my attention and put my eyes over here and say, no, I was over here. So, oh, okay, Lord, that's fine with me. I don't care how God answers my prayer. As long as he pays attention to me and answers it somehow. I don't ever want to be called of God treacherous. Paul, what a thing to talk, tell somebody. They're treacherous. Well, that was not Nathaniel. Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. So, you can take Isaiah 48 here and you can see some Israelites that have guile. They're not Nathaniel. He wasn't like this. When God dealt with him, he had a good, pure heart. When God said something to him, he said, Oh, that's God talking to me. I believe that thing. Look, if you don't have a good heart, you go to this book and you say, God, show me something. I really need to know some things about such and such and so and so. God, and you go to God with a good heart, God will show you some things. And you don't always have to come to the... In fact, if you never... Go to the preacher for advice. It would just be just fine. As long as you got God talking to you. Some people come to the preacher like he's the, the fountain of all knowledge for their life. No. I don't hardly know anything about people. I can't give people decent advice. How am I going to give them good advice? I don't know about it. I don't know about you really. I, I mean, people that come to church, they put their best clothes on they're on their best behavior that's all i really see even when i go visit in their house you know they're they're back there uh, when i'm knocking at the door there's all oh, the pre I, i've heard them you know go up to a trailer and i've heard them in the trailer oh it's the preacher quick put some stuff away and i hear them scrambling <laughs> inside <laughs> and then uh, just a minute preacher scramble 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 just a minute scramble 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 and finally they open the door hey preacher how you doing <laughs> well i don't know what they were doing putting the ouija board away <laughs> i don't know but so you can't get a good idea about that if you're the preacher you just have to trust the lord with your people and his advice to you is trust the lord with yourself and he'll show you what you need to know. Um, he'll take you where you need to go. That's what he does with people that he loves. And people that love him and have no guile when they come to him. Look, if you're angry about something that God's done, go tell God. God, I'm angry at you. You did something I didn't like. God will explain it to you. He will. Might not be real pleasant, but he will explain it to you. But if you're honest with God, he'll be more gentle with you than if you try to go, uh, you know, like one of these slimy people I was talking about. You can't slime God. God looks, God sees through all the slime and the oily and the whole, the whole nine yards. You might as well just plunk down on your knees and say, God, this is, this is. This is what I think. You can look at my heart. I might as well just be totally honest with you. And you'll get by better with the Lord that way than you ever will by trying to fool God. So Nathaniel, when God went up to him, he saw a person. He said, well, I need Nathaniel. Here, here's a guy that's not going to try to fool, fool anybody about me. Or sell them a, a box of soap. Or, or, or you know, uh, just, just try to lead them on the primrose path. Here's a guy that's going to be a straight shooter, an honest guy. And I can use a man like that. Or a woman like that. Alright. We'll look at some more stuff next week. I probably would have had more stuff to teach this morning, but... Uh, I took a COVID shot Friday and I was pretty ill yesterday, so 
I didn't get a chance to study any more stuff. So um, maybe next week I'll, I'll do a little better. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, help us now as we go uh, into the next service. Be with us, Lord. Help us. And I pray you just uh, look after us, Lord. Help us to have no guile like oh, good old Nathaniel. And Lord, thank you that you met this man and you wanted him to be on your team. God, make us part of your team. And Lord, show us what you'd have us to do every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.